Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for attending our online event for August for Our Ladies Melbourne, where tonight Anna will be presenting a summary of her experience at the USAR 2021 virtual conference. I would like to begin this meeting by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land from where each of us are joining from today. For me, I respectfully acknowledge the Yalakut William clan of the Bunarong, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. Please also take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where you may be joining us from this evening, and join me in paying our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us tonight. So before Anna begins her presentation for this evening, just a few notes. Um, as usual, we are always on the lookout uh, for new speakers, um, conveners of workshops, um, and um, the like. So if you um, think this is something you are interested in or would like to get involved, please send us an email, message on Twitter, Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the committee of 2020 and for all their hard work um, over the last uh, 12 months. And you can see everyone pictured here. So thanks very much for your efforts. Um, likewise, if you'd like to read the annual report for the events um, and a summary of what's happened in the last 12 months, please follow the link here. Um, and with that, uh, we can introduce uh, the 2021 committee members and um, in particular, we welcome Shazia as the president uh, of the committee. Um, and we look forward to the next 12 months and hope you can join us for all events um, to come. Um, with that, you can find us on YouTube, Meetup, LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. So make sure you're keeping an eye on all these um, these. Uh, platforms. Um, so with that, um, we are very excited this evening to have Anna, whom I'm sure many of you know very well and may have heard speak before. Um, tonight, Anna will share her use our experience um, with us. Anna has an academic background in statistics. Most recently, Anna joined WEHI where she completed her master's research in population genetics and then a PhD in cancer genomics. She has since worked as a data scientist for an AI consulting company. And two months ago, she joined the Melbourne-based startup Mass Dynamics, where she is working as a bioinformatics data scientist. There she is developing workflows for the analysis of mass spectrometry data to help more life scientists transform proteomics data to knowledge. Thanks so much, Anna, for sharing your experience with us this evening. I'm really forward to looking for, um, to hearing about what you have to share with us. And I think Anna is happy to take questions along the way. So please type anything in the chat or um, raise your hand um, uh, or you can keep it till the end. All right. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I'm going out. I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me. Okay. So can you all see my slides? Can you see yes. my slides? Yes. Like my, my yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you so much for everyone for coming tonight. Um, I have to say, I put together these slides, I did these slides yesterday and Sunday. So there will be a little bit of typos, but don't worry. If you spot any, let me know and then I'm happy to share with, with, with everyone after, uh, after the, the, um, the talk. So tonight, as K Kathleen was saying, I'm going to share with you my experience of at attending the remote user. And before I do that, however, I wanted to share a little bit about my background because I know that Kathleen also shared it, but I know that I, I often get asked a lot of questions from my people for because I tried a little bit of research and then I moved into industry. So I just want to let everyone know what's my path. Uh, so even if the end of the talk uh, or after you would like to connect, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask as well. And also another thing, all the beautiful artwork that you see in all the different section of my talk, they're actually all made with R and they were all shown at the user. So I'm going to share at the end a link to the art, art gallery, which was shared later, which are all very beautiful. And I don't know exactly how they are made. The, the artists are not actually, they don't, they don't share the exact code, I think, of course, 
but um, you, you might be able, if you're interested, definitely you should be able to try some. So a bit about me, if I can, yeah. So I am originally from Italy, and as uh, Kathleen said, I've completed my master in, in bachelor, bachelor and master in statistics between the University of Bologna, Glasgow, and Melbourne. I arrived in Melbourne in 2013, and it was actually in that year that I discovered what is bioinformatics. So you, you might have heard about bi bioinformatics, which is that discipline which brings together a little bit of mathematics and statistics and some computer science with the, in, in the domain of bi bi biology. So be, before Melbourne, I didn't know about that. So I got really excited and I really, really loved it. So I did my master and then I did my PhD. But after that, I wasn't really sure that a full academic path was for me, which is why in 2019, I decided to try something different. So I, I went outside of research. So uh, after my PhD, I then joined the con con consultancy El ELISA, which uh, is a data science con consultancy. And I was there for about a year and a half. I spent there all my COVID time. And uh, however, I was missing science, which is why I got the opportunity two months ago to then join the startup where I'm working now. So since two months, I've joined the Melbourne Bay startup, which is called Mass Dynamics. And I would define myself as a bioinformatics data scientist, sort of like an intersection. I'm not a full on researcher, but I do some research, but I don't do just research. And just to give an idea of what is Mass dy Dynamics, and I feel pretty privileged to, to be able to work in a company whose mission is to free humanity and society from the burden of diseases by helping more life scientists to transform proteomics data to knowledge better, faster and easier. If you don't know what proteomics data are, basically everything that is around the analysis of proteins is falls under the uh, under the um, umbrella of proteomics. So this is pretty cool, right? But of course, what do I actually do every day? It's quite different. So a lot of my time, definitely, I really like to work in a, in a, I work in a fun team. We are about 13, 14 people now, and there's some scientists, there's some developers, there's some marketing savvy. Everyone has to do a little bit of different things, which is the good thing of being in a small company. We, I, there's also a lot of learning as well. I've been learning a lot about mass spectrometry, which is the most used technique to quantify proteins in a sample. And I also need to interact with uh, scientists, so people that actually do the experiments to understand what they actually need from their data. And a lot of that requires definitely coding in R. So I spend a lot of time coding in R and in particular developing workflows for mass spectrometry data. Coding in R also means that we try to really strive to make our product and our, um, our, our, our packages rep reproducible. We want to open source them. And of course, this required a big learning curve, which is why I decided to, which why I really like the conferences like HUSAR or the Bioconductor Conference, which will be very soon at the beginning, well, actually this week, uh, because it's always a great way to meet new people and learn about new methods and tools. So in a nutshell, I started learn, think, build some R packages and a lot of debugging and then repeat. But it's really, really fun. So this is about me, and now let's go into USAR. This is an artwork from Will Chase, which is called Terrazzo Confetti. So USAR 2021, of course, was online, and it was very different from the first time that I attended, which was in 2018 in Brisbane. I could say that USAR is one, is one of my favorite conferences, uh, just because of the community and the vibe, and there's always some new exciting things to talk about, and that and that you find out. So this was us in 2018. There's a group of our ladies with Jenny Bryan and many other people in Brisbane. It was a great time to be able to have a dinner all together. Unfortunately, this year it looked like this, which looked like um, it was online. I couldn't, I didn't actually take part at the our, our ladies meetup uh, on, um, on Zoom because in Melbourne it was about 9 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. and so I, I had to go out for dinner. And probably if you know um, 
if you know if, if you are from Melbourne, you will know that every opportunity to go out for dinner is good because you never know when the next lockdown will happen. So you can't miss it. But nonetheless, I believe that the organizer made a great job because even though we were all on different time zones, they really managed to put for different time zones, they put a very broad and diverse range of topics so that you didn't feel like you were missing out on some things. Of course, as a disclaimer, everything that I'm going to present tonight, also not by chance co corresponds to talks that I could attend because they were in my time zone. However, uh, all the talks and the workshops will be made all available online on YouTube very soon. So I'll keep you posted and we'll make sure that we share the link with everyone so that um, whenever they come out, you'll be able to see seminar talks and everything else. So getting into the details and more the juice of my talk, these are the topics that I will, that I aim to cover tonight. There is a lot there. There's a lot of like packages and tools and discussions. Uh, I'm aware that I might not be able to get until the end, but I've just, you know, of course the window is quite noisy. But um, I'm also, I, I just wanted to put all the details and the links that I could attend, that I could follow during the conferences. And even, the, even though I won't manage to get through everything, you will have all the materials and link there. So I want to start with teaching and learning statistics. This was a, se a session on Thursday. On, so this was at the beginning of July. I really like this session, not because I teach, I mean, I learn, I learn statistics, but I believe that uh, the way in which, in which the, the tools that we use for teaching are so important and to make it fun and to make it, to make people to really engage with the data is really, really important for how we learn and how we remember things. So as part of this session, I would like to introduce you to the uh, Penguin da data set. And as with every conference, you might find that if you attend a conference, you might see that there are some themes which happen at the conference. I do think that this data set was kind of a theme. This is the Palmer Penguins data set, which I don't know if you've seen it, but I'm pretty sure it's got, it's got the potential to become really famous. And I'm going to explain why. So the first talk that I've attended was from Alison Horst. So Alison introduced the package that she developed with other colleagues and is the Alter Data Sampler, where Alter stands for Long-Term Ecological Research Program. So I don't wanna go into the details about this package, but the, I wanna talk about the message that I got from, from the talk. And the lesson learned from this talk was that as so Alison is, um, is the artist in residence at our studio, but she's also an educator and a trainer and she writes amazing training materials that I'm sure everyone can find them really, really useful. And so what she says from her experience is that a great way, way to learn how to build an art package is to build, is to create a data package. So you, you don't you don't you have to, we, we have to stop thinking that if i don't have a super complex cool new functions then i cannot run in our package you just need maybe a little piece of code but maybe you have been scraping the web because of uh, to find some covid data maybe you have scraped to find some olympics data and then you have clean up a data set maybe that's a great way that's already a great way to start and making your r package because she found that it was actually a pretty fun way to teach also to students different skills about data cleaning and then packaging up your data and sharing your data, which is really, really important. And as a free gift by making data packages, uh, you probably also may give to many other educator because uh, sharing data by packages is one of the best way to share knowledge and being able to share new e e example data with, with others. And in particular, how many times have you used the iris data set if you've never seen the iris data set i i'm not going to talk about it now you just need to know that it was made in 1936 by ronald fisher which was a very famous statistician everyone would agree but the iris data set maybe has been overused to explain the, how model works so the uh, so the idea is that palmer penguins will become the new iris. So 
I'm going to show you now what the Palmer Penguins data contains. But the idea is that the iris data set contain a lot of different measurements from iris, which is a type of flower. It contains sepal, le sepal length, sepal width, uh, the types of roses. And it was used in a lot of examples to show how different methods works. Uh, work in, in particular, I think it was used a lot to show how linear dis discriminant analysis works in the first place. So it should show some, the data should be able to show some kind of groupings which is exactly what the penguins do. So the Palmer penguins actually, so we built by Alison Horst, Alison Hill, uh, which are both at our studio. Kristen Gorman um, was actually the one who also went to Antarctica to collect the data. So these are the penguins that Kristen uh, took the picture of, where this one instead is the artwork that Alison Horst made. So it is probably way cooler than the very, very old Aris data set. So this is the, um, just a screenshot of the head, sorry, um, the head of the pe 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 Palmer penguins, because I'm going to be using it in, in some examples tonight. So I wanted to introduce to, I wanted to introduce that to you as well. So in the Palmer penguins data, we have the species of penguins. We have the islands where the penguins come from, and we have different measurements of the bill lengths, bill depth, flipper lengths, and so on. And this is an example of how they look like if you plot them. So you can see that it's got some sort of grouping and so you can use it to show different way of coloring things or grouping and cl classifications, clustering and so on. So here we go with the Palme penguins. So the closing thoughts from Alison talk were that modern curated and well documented data sets are in demand and are really greatly up appreciated by everyone that creates any training um, Ma ma materials. And then our packages are a great way to share this, this data. And then it's also a great way to show, for example, to students how to build your data and also how to clean your data. So this was from Alison. And even though it wasn't part of the of, of the art conference, I just wanted to put here some examples and some ideas and some tools that I found really useful in how to create your art package. I have to say that my first star package, I built it maybe, I tried to build it really, it was pretty disastrous, maybe nine years ago. And it was a big learning curve. It wasn't great. The documentation was really hard. And I don't think I did a great job at the end. I remember I was, since probably a couple of years ago, I was really scared about building another one. But during my PhD, I had to build another one. And so I tried. And I started following the R Packages book, which was written by Hadley Wickham. And really, it's just so easy, so easy to understand. It's very comprehensive, and it makes everything really look so easy. Like the setup has never been so easy. Then, of course, you can build on top of it, but to set it up, it's fine. The only thing that you need to start really is maybe one function, just as an example, or some data. You need to you need a project folder, just a folder in your computer. And you need to run this function. Use this create package. You can find more info into the book as well. And so this create package will create the basic information and the basic package structure that you need for, for your package. And then you're pretty much set up. Uh, so this create package will create this basic folder structure. And if you want to add some data, how easy is that? So here I made some fake data. You can just run this command, use this, use data. And this will automatically add a data folder in your uh, R package structure. And so you're done for now. You've got your minimal package structure. And then from then you can build on top of it. So how easy is that? If, however, you are a person who loves R markdown and you're really, you know, you, you write writing documents and you've never written your R package, you might want to try a different approach. So this is a talk that um, a talk from the speaker Sebastien Rochette uh, was a talk at the conference where he introduced his package Fusion. I think you spell it Fusion or Fusion. I cannot remember. And the idea is that if you know how to create an R markdown file, then you know how to build a package. I put the link of the introduction to that one to them to Fusion there. But the idea is really is that 
um, you don't need to move around. If you're scared about, you know, building a package, move around all the different files and function, you don't need to do that with, with Fusion. You just need your R markdown written with some functions, some examples, maybe some tests, and then Fusion will create the package for you. And I'm going to show you how. It looks very easy. I've actually tried it, and the setup is super easy. So the idea of uh, Fusion is that you write your R markdown file. The only thing that you need to know is that to, you need to put some pre prefixes in the in the name code chunks. And I'm going to show you an example there. So the prefixes in the name in the code in the name of the code chunks will tell Fusion Fusion how to create the package. So this is how it works. Hopefully you can see good, but if you go into the link that I sent you in the first slide, you will see this uh, picture better or an example. So the idea is that, for example, this is your R markdown. You have a chunk which is called the description, a chunk which is called functions one, examples one, test one. And if you run Fusion Inflate on this file, it will automatically create all your package structure there. So it's going to put the test in the test folder, the R, the functions in the R folder, and so on. So depending on what, what, what you find more useful, you can either go via the more comprehensive R packages book by Hadley, which I still suggest you to read for comprehensiveness, or you can try in this way as well. Given an R markdown, try to inflate it. I'm going to go now to the next um, talk in the session, which was about which was run by Mine. This was about the open intro project. I never heard about the open intro project, but it sounds really, really useful. In particular, you have the open intro website, which has lots of re re resources, as you can see here about statistics, by statistics and for teachers and others. and um, and it, everything is free, so you can find everything for free. And you, then you also have the open intro R package, which has all the su supplemental functions for the open intro uh, book. And again, everything is for free. Also in this talk, and this should conclude this section about teaching, the lesson learned, and another lesson that Mina again suggested is that it's really having data centric package is so important to share data and to share examples. One of the challenges, of course, is that if you have a very big data set, it might be too big to put into one package. But the way in which Open Intro does to have example packages is to uh, you can split up and break up your data packages into smaller chunks and then bring them together and or orchestrate them all into one main package, which depends on the other ones. So for example, the open intro package in the deep dependencies of the package will have these other three da da data sets. So when you load open intro, you will also get the other ones. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the last one uh, that I had from this section. I didn't actually attend this talk. I was meant to, and then something came up. But this is a, seems like a really useful resource for learning and teaching Bayesian statistics, if that's something that interests you. The base rule package contains a lot of the, uh, the functionalities and the data to accompany the book, which, uh, which is the base rules is an in introduction to Bayesian modeling with R, which is a more comprehensive book. But unfortunately, I didn't attend this talk. This is the end of section one. Um, I don't know if there was any talk, um, sorry, any question. Otherwise, I'll... I cannot see the chat at the moment. So no, it was all good. Okay. Awesome. So the next part was about data vis visualization. This artwork was made by Yamaka Aniene, and it's entitled Sunset. So for, for this section, I decided to put together also, bring together also a keynote uh, talk. So the first keynote that I saw was Paul Morrow, Paul Morrow who uh, is from New Zealand, actually. So it was in my time zone, which was really good. And he's the author of the package GR Devices. So in this um, in this part of so GR devices, grid, and all these sort of packages, I'm not super familiar with all of those ones, and definitely 
uh, they belong to a low level R graphics. But I think it's still useful to know that they are there and know what, what you can do with them in case you'll ever find, you know, in, in that situation. So the idea of grid. So here, this is um, a picture that Paul shared that shows you how all these packages are interconnected with each other. So the grid package is a low level system on which ggplot2 is also based. So all ggplot2 is based on grid. And grid uh, our graphics is also different uh, from the base graphics. So there is base, gra base graphics, our gra sorry, base graphics, grid graphics, and ggplot takes from grid graphics. So the idea of when you want to use grid, well, normally in mo most of the time, unless you are a developer, you won't use grid. You will use ggplot2, which already offers a large set of fun fun functionalities to plot all the different plots that you need. But if you're thinking about extending some functionalities which are not present in ggplot, you might wanna go and look at grid. So example on how grid has been, uh, has been expanded recently, and this is what Paul was talking about. For instance, you can make this uh, interesting um, radial or gradient fields which is a little bit similar of what you would do if you had to work in Illustrator. So if you want to make more complex graphics, and in this, um, in this blog post, Paul shares a lot of the new features which were added, I think, last year to the grid package. So you can make this sort of gradient fields. You can put patterns into your, you can build up patterns, so basic low-level patterns. Of course, like you might say, well, I can do that. I, I can do everything in Illustrator or something else. Well, not everyone has Illustrator, but also if you wanna make your graphic completely re reproducible and sharing it, that's the way to go as well. And just to give you an idea, this is some things that you could do, for example, using grid. So this is another post, another talk, sorry, that he, that Paul was sharing and how you, um, how you can use grid to actually go beyond statistical plots. So you don't, you can use grid to make really w w whatever you want. Just to give you an idea from his slides, the, this is a sort of plot that he explained in this talk, how you can make using grid by using the shape, by using overlapping with shapes and, and so on. So it looks really cool. Definitely there could be a little bit of a learning cur curve because it's quite low level, but it is doable if, um, if you're interested in it. Instead, going a little bit more high level, I really love this package that I discovered at the conference. So the author of this package, Virgo. So Virgo is the R interface for the grammar of graphics based on Vega lights. So the two authors are Stuart Lee and Irovan, which are also my friends. And I didn't know that they made it, so I was really surprised and happy to, to see it there. And the reason is that with Virgo, you can make easily, easy interactive graphics to e explore your data. It is true that you also have Plotly and you also have other options and you also are, are shiny, but I find this Virgo quite to have a good potential, especially in terms of like to allow cross interactivity between plots without having to build a full shiny app, but just in a few lines of codes. And also you can, you can include Virgo plots into Shiny if you would like to. To give you an idea of how it works. So here I'm loading, of course, the Palme penguins. That's what I'm gonna use for the whole talk. We've got Virgo, we've got the Palme penguins and uh, the selection tool, the selection method is what Virgo uses to create a selection to use as selection. And I'm gonna show you now what, for example, if I do this, I am selecting a part of the plot. So this will be taken into account and stored in the selection tool. So this is the uh, Virgo code to create this plot, which is a simple scatter plot and allows you to select, you know, a part that you like. Maybe there's nothing much there yet. I mean, it's maybe you could do this with other tools. Here I'm making another, well, I'm using this an example from the Virgo vignette. You can make an histogram, and this is the body mass index of the penguins, and you can again select it. 
oops, yeah, you can again select it. So while you select it, it also shows you the mean of your selection. I think sometimes it doesn't work well on the slides. I've noticed it, but anyway. Um, so here, here you can select, and here you can build the selection and create this moving average mean on your um, on your on your histogram. I might try to refresh because sometimes that might help. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the cool things that I really like is this one. So how easy is then to concatenate the two plots? So say, for example, I want to see by selecting this part, I want to also see directly uh, where they fit into this histogram. You can directly do that. And you can imagine all the possible up application of this. When you've got a scatter plot on one side, you want to see how it changes on the other side. I remember that I was looking for a solution like this and um, the main thing that I could find until maybe some time ago was to use Shiny, which is definitely good, but it might take more time than just a few lines of code like, like, like this one. So I really, really like this package and I hope they're gonna keep developing it more. Um, the, the, la the last uh, package that I wanna share from this section is instead about is the micro shades package. So micro shades was shared by Lisa Carstens, which is a PhD student, but actually I think she's a lab head, but I managed to confirm. And uh, the micro shade actually was built to introduce new color palettes, which are meant to be more accessible. So for color vision, the, the efficient people, it, offer, it also offers way more color and easy to use um, color palette. It is available on GitHub for the moment, but I'm sure it will be on CRAN soon. The idea of micro shades is that it's got, it has two different crafted color palette. One, which is specifically CVD uh, color vision deficient palette. And the other one, I'm pretty sure the other one is also uh, for CVD uh, people. And I'm not an expert in color vision deficiency, but there are definitely all different levels and types of it. And so uh, Lisa has been really working a lot to make sure that she, she could include and sort of be com comprehensible and create colors which are ac accessible for a broad range of people. So, and in each color palette, because of all these different micro shades and uh, shades, of course, you have 30 colors which are available in each co co color palette. And to show you how it looks like, of course, on the penguins in action, this is how it looks like using the default ggplot color graphics. And this is instead how you would see it uh, with the penguin, um, sorry, not with the penguin, with the micro shades um, palette. And as you can see, uh, you can also select the different shades to also specify different types of levels within every section, sorry, within every group. So here we have the penguin type Adelie in three different years. So you can also show that difference within each group. So I found this really interesting. And in particular, she also showed a lot of different examples. Um, oops, I think I might have shared the wrong uh, link here, but she showed example how to use this. Uh, this is for the penguin, but non microbial data. Oh, yeah, in the, on, on, on the GitHub page, which I linked here, yeah, in this one, she shows, uh, for example, how this is really useful, especially in microbiome, uh, or like when you have a lot of different colors and classes, you might have seen this sort of population structure, and I think is, yeah, the different population. So you can make sure to have a better distinction between the colors and also, of course, more accessible to a broader range of people, which is also something which is something that we all should care a lot about. And this concludes my second sec uh, section. I don't know if there's any question, otherwise I'll keep going. All good. The next session is around data validation and testing. So you might have heard about uh, testing when you build an R package, or for example, if you build a package and you create functions, the idea of testing is 
you want to test that the function does exactly what it's meant to do. And that's why we build tests. And the data validation part is, for example, when you, again, you, you might create a package, you might create an app, it doesn't have to be a package or just something that you want to validate that the input and what you are looking at is exactly what you expect. Usually, I mean, in the past, so even, even today, even before funding about um, finding out about these packages, I would have put a lot of like, if, uh, you know, if there are an A, then throw an error, stop if you find this. But these packages, and especially this, oh, I think I put it in a different order. Never mind. I'm going to start with the testing and then I'm going on to validation. So the first package that I introduce is the auto test, which is automatic testing for our packages. It was um, uh, created by Mark Patga, which who is a software research scientist for our open side. And it's on CRAN. And the idea of auto test is that is to, so auto test will go into your R package, into all the examples of the functions in your R package, and it will mutate, sort of like change, trying, different inputs parameters so, so that is going to try to see if the if we different sort of com, com, combination of inputs your functions pass the test or they fail so instead of you having to try all different sample data and try all different tests it will automatically try and to understand from the examples in your data try um all different inputs to see uh, if it is enough robust to all different inputs. And this is um, auto test in action. I haven't run it directly in the slides just because it takes a few seconds and so I didn't want to slow it down. But the idea is that in this call of auto test package, you need to provide a package. So in this case, we are testing the, it's, I think it's a base R, the stats package. And you specify the function that you want to test. In this case, it's the var for variance. And auto test will run all sorts of combinations of different inputs, and it will tell you if the test fails or not. So here you can see it tells you the type. So there's some warnings, there's some diagnostic there. This is the function name that is testing. Of course, because um, variance and correlation are connected, while it's testing the variance, it also call other functions, and so it's testing also other function. So here you can see all the different functions that the auto test has been testing and which parameter it has been trying to flip and change and try all different things. And by, so by using the output from this data, so pretty much it is a data frame, you can then go back and understand if there's something, um, something failed, if there were some warnings, if there were operation which were weird and so on. So, it definitely is really useful. The only thing, of course, that you need to have in your R package is you need to provide examples in your function so that auto test can go there and try all different inputs. Another really interesting package is the tiny test uh, package for, for unit testing. So Mark van der Loo uh, built this package. He also built the other validation package, which I'm going to introduce soon. Tiny test is tiny because it's meant to be really lightweight. It's a very minimal, simple, not as minimal package, like, but it's it, it doesn't depend on a lot of other packages. It really just meant to make the development of unit testing easy and um, also clean, clean and easy. So compared to I, I haven't tried it yet because I've been always using test that which is still really good as well, but I've never, um, I never, I, sh I should probably give, give a go as well to tiny test to see how it changes and how it's different. But in theory, it gives you some better function, more straightforward to make it easier to build unit testing. And also it provides um, different errors and different stats to give you more ideas where the error occurred. And, the idea, um, as you can see, there is a linear increase in the number of packages on CRAN and Bioconductor, which are using tiny tests for their de development. This is tiny test in action, just to give an idea what is testing and what, what it means. 
So here we have two functions. We have add one and sub one. Add one will add one to a number that you give and sub one will subtract one. So this test should pass. We have <clears throat> the tiny test function expect equal. So what you need to provide is like, this is the current result. So if I apply the add one to one, it will give me a result. And this is the expected result. So as of course you say, well, this passed because if I add one to one, it gives me two. But if I, uh, in, in this case instead, because it, the function is called sub one, but I was actually subtracting two, so it was wrong. Uh, sub one applied to two should in theory give me one, but it's not. So this test is, fails, is failed and it tells you that this call has failed and the difference is this expected one, but it got zero. So give it a go if you're in, if you're, if you're developing packages, definitely. And you can find all the other functionality and function to use at this link. For example, um, this is one example. This is probably the most common expect equal current value should be equal to an expected value, but there are of course many, many other ones. The last, I think should be the last package for the, for the session that I really liked is this validate package. So the purpose, which is the author of this package is still Mark van der Loo. The purpose is to provide really very easy way to validate your data. You can find more resources at this link. One is a full book about data validation and things that you can, um, uh, things that you can do. And um, the other thing, yeah, whereas this one is the GitHub link to, to the package. To give you an idea of how Validate in Action works, again, we go back to the Penguin dataset. Just to refresh your mind, this is how the Penguin dataset is structured. We have spaces, islands, and some features of the penguins. For example, if you had to validate some other data, you might think, oh, well, <clears throat> If you have to build a predictive model or you need to cluster the data, you might want to make sure that you have complete data. For example, you want to make sure that you don't have these sort of things where everything is an A. You want to make sure, for example, that your the length or width or depth of the build is actually positive. You can't have negative values. Otherwise, probably there's been some input errors. Another thing that you might want to check is to cross validate between columns. So con conditional uh, validation. So say, for example, you know that uh, on the Bisco Island, you can only have Adelie and Gentoo penguins. So if you find chin strap, it could be true, but you might also want to check that that's correct, that has been re re reported correctly. So I try to build a valid validator to show you how it works. You can build va validator as set of rules. And the way in which you put rules is that you can separate rules by different commas. It's super easy. And the, the e e example below also shows you how you can combine the conditional vali validation rules uh, by looking, for example, of the completeness of a row and so on. So this is my val validator. I load the library validate and I create my rules. This is the validator function. I require that the flipper length is larger than zero, that all these fields are complete, which means there's no NA. And here I'm making actually a mistake in my assumption. I'm saying if the island is Bisco, then species should be Adeli, which I know that is wrong because yeah, as I showed you, if the island is Visco, we can have both penguins. So this should give me, uh, you know, some errors in output. And this is the output. So you can apply with the confront function, you can apply the rules to your penguin data set, and it will show you that, okay, the first validation rules, which is this one, uh, it's all passed. So you have everything passes and no fails. For the second rules, which is checking for completeness of the data, it's got two fails because two were two rows at all at NA values. And then, of course, we, it tells me that we have 124 fails, 
because of course we have also the gentle penguins which lives on the Biscone Highland. So that's just to give you an idea, but I really find this super useful because if I remember all the time I had to write if this, then do this, or, and instead by applying all these rules, you have your data set at the end and you can already parse this data set to figure out what rules have failed, where to go and debug your code or your data and so on. So give it a go to make sure that your data is in a healthy state. This concludes also um, this part. Again, if there's no questions, I keep going. I'll keep going. With this one, this is a talk that I've seen at um, a user, but I'm not gonna talk about it. This will be a teaser for you for next month. And uh, the talk was called, Here is the An Anomalous Down. The talk was by Dr. Sevandi Kandanarachchi. Hopefully I spelled it correctly. Uh, or sorry, pronounced it correctly. And the, uh, so Sevandi shared with the, with the community two R packages that she's been developing with Rob Hinman as well from um, uh, Monash. And uh, here I put the link of the, the two packages, Dobbin and Lookout. These two packages are aimed at finding anomalies, so anomalous data in high dimensional data. When you think of anomalies, of course, you think of something that maybe is strange, distinguished from the rest. Sometimes it could be good, but most of the time you might want to make sure that you know about those things. For instance, say that you're mo monitoring the heart uh, rhythm of some patients and you have a measurements over a different time and you have measurements for different, different things, not just one specific uh, thing. And you would like to detect, uh, for example, if there are some anomalies in the heart rate based also on other things. Well, this could be, for example, th this, this might help to understand if there could be a heart failure or it could be other things. Other, uh, other um, I remember other fields in which this was really useful is when you maybe work in a bank or for con consultancy, there is a big um, interest in finding anomalies in tra transaction history or finding fraudulent activity in the credit cards. So I'm really curious to know about next month um, to hear more about these packages. So this is all I'm gonna say for now. So if you're interested, we're going to announce it soon and um, yeah, Sevandi will tell us all about it. And this will bring me to the next section. I'm just gonna open slide the window because it's really warm. Let me know if it gets uh, noisy because of the wind. So the next session, um, I've attended another keynote. It was the only two keynotes that I could attend. This keynote was from Heidi Seibold and uh, the, the keynote talk was about research software engineers, which the acronym is RSC and academia. Again, as the penguins was a theme of the conference, I've also found that this RSC was a theme of the company. I as the company of the conference. I had never heard about RSCs before, but it seems to be something that is increasingly gaining popularity and visibility as well. So what are research software engineers? This is a definition from researchsoftware.org because research software engineer community was started in the UK. So research software engineers are people who combine professional software expertise with an understanding of research. They go by various job titles, but the term research software engineer is fast gaining international re recognition. So the way that I understood and I like really to share this with a lot of you because you might be you might have been working in research you might have thinking oh what what is my path maybe you really like the software you don't think that maybe a full academic path is for you i'm not sure and i did actually think that while i was hearing this talk i could see a lot of the things that i like as well and it was really good to know that there is the actual movement uh, around so before I dive back into the RSC, I just wanted to share also a little bit about Heidi, who I believe she's actually now working as an RSC. So Heidi is currently working at the Joiner Institute in Munich, um, and she did a 
a path which could be similar to mine or to a lot of us. Um, maybe she's a bachelor and master in statistics and a PhD, then a postdoc. She became a professor, then more postdocs. Then she became a group lead. And, but then she realized the group lead wasn't the things that she really maybe wanted to do. She was really passionate about software and open science. She became a science and education ambassador, giving a lot of talks. And so she thought, and she got to know about this community and um, that's where she started heading. So she's not a group lead as per se anymore, but she's working more as a supporting a lot of the research, uh, which is done in the, I think it's a small company where she's working now. And just as a side note, she also recently started a podcast. If you're interested in open science, um, she started this podcast called Open Science Stories. I haven't had the time to listen to any of them yet, but I really love to. And the good thing is also that sometimes they are pretty short, like you might have three, five minutes, 10, 10 minutes, where she tries to talk. It's pretty informal, she talks to different speakers, people that are interested in open science to hear about how they go about it in their daily research. So going back to the RSC, what does an RSC do? This is how Heidi was, was e e explaining it. So an RSC builds software for research. So yeah, and generally writes code also might teach about software to other researchers. So it's really passionate about code, building software, building tools that are useful for research. And often also gets consulted, so consults um, for any kind of related software problems. So this is sort of like what would happen. An RSC might get developed, consulting, support the project, teach about software and write it. But of course, when you want to write software in a good way, and if you want to make something really robust and lastable, last and usable, you uh, might need to know a lot. And so there's a lot of talk about um, building software and making sure that science is open and rep 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 reproducible. And of course, when you start thinking about reproducibility and openness, there is all these tools that come to mind, which is version controls, Git and automation and naming and doing all. So there is not just making an R package, there is a whole things around. So of course, to expect that uh, a researcher will be will do his own research, plus being really proficient and good and efficient in all of this is a big ask, of course. And that's why the RSC comes to help. And that's why it's gaining popularity. And uh, I'm not sure exactly. I've never heard about it in Australia, even though at the, at the user conference, there has been a few sessions, which unfortunately I wasn't able to attend because they were during the night, where there is really a lot to try to, to see how we can connect more the community, how what initiative we can do to sort of like make sure that these sort of people have visibility in the lab or in the research group where they work on. So if you think that this is something that might do for you, you can find more about it become part of the community. So um, you can find RSC. I'm not sure that they're having research that there is an RSC community in Australia, but I don't think so yet. You might um, create a, a, a awareness, follow maybe some podcasts like this one that Heidi was suggesting or the one that she's also uh, running. And she was suggesting that there will be this upcoming, uh, upcoming blog, blog post incubator the role of the R community in the RSC movement. So I strongly suggest, yeah, it seems really useful, especially if you really see yourself into this part of the community. So this brings me to my last section. I believe there's no other question because otherwise I would have seen them. Yep, cool. So the last section is R in production. And I'm going to tell this section is going to be a little bit more um, like more tech, I mean, everything in this talk was very technical, but definitely it's probably even more, more like if you are actually developing something. But I thought it was still really useful to uh, talk about it because I'm not sure exactly what is the audience of this talk and where everyone comes from. But I have to say that having worked over the past uh, about two years in industry, 
this has become more and more of a problem for me. And just to figure out what's the best way of going about it to make sure that everything that we build, especially because we build software for research, is safe and sound and robust. So first of all, just to make sure that we all agree that we are on the same page, what does it mean, our introduction? Uh, of course, it means many different things. This is what it means for me now, and everyone might agree or disagree. So from my example, it's like, I, I've told you I'm a data scientist for mass dynamics. I build R, R packages so that I can help life scientists to analyze their mass spectrometry data. But mass dynamics wants to make all these R packages and fu functionality available, easily available to life scientists, which might not be expert coders. So, um, but so they so mass dynamics wants to reduce the barrier to access these packages to people that are not actually able that they otherwise they will have to code themselves. Or for example, scientists that are in a lab where there is no support. Um, computational persons for them. So the idea is that the solution that Mass Dynamics uh, now is using is that, well, maybe we can have an easy to use um, UI, which is the user interface where the life scientists can interact, which runs in the back in the background, it runs my R packages and it shows you the result and allows the user to interact in different ways with the packages. So of course, this, this means that every time a scientist interacts with the UI, the R package is run, and that's what happens. So this is a R in production. So every time someone uploads some data, the R package is run. So how do we do that? And what, what is tricky about it? So definitely there's a lot of engineering and setup behind all the structure. Normally we might use cloud services. I'm not gonna, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about all these things, and, um, but I wanna mention some tricky aspects and things that I found useful and that we as our developers and our, you know, if we build an app package could actually um, make sure that we keep in mind. So as I was saying, there's a lot of aspects around engineering and setup. Um, so like big infrastructure, which is not my expertise and I'm not gonna mention now, but from my side, I wanna make sure that, um, I've actually had a I had a picture in mind to show up to, but the idea is that we as developers we create our packages in our local computer on our desktop, and then these our packages will have to be deployed and built and used on the cloud somewhere else in an environment which is very different to what we have here, and of course many things can go wrong because we don't have as much flexibility to access that environment. So I wanna make sure that all the dependencies that all the packages and all the things that my package need to be run in the cloud are available. And I want to make sure that all the packages that are put into production have a defined version so that whoever is going to use them and whoever wants to access them, they can reproduce all that I'm building. So managing all these dependencies and uh, can, can be really tricky. The reason is that when you have a package that has some dependencies, then those dependencies have other dependencies and there's a chain that can become really, really tricky. There is always a little bit of overhead at the beginning when you start building this all set up. But once you are set up and you've got good tools to set you up, you should make it easier. So I've attended a few sessions about R in production at the, well, one, one session, there were two or three. I could only attend one because it was in my time, time zone. And I've discussed and I've asked some questions to the um, speakers just to see what they do normally. So, uh, yeah, just to make sure that we all know what package dependencies are. So the package dependencies are what you find in the description file of your R package, and they are described under depends, imports, and system requirements. System requirements are dependencies that are outside of R. An example, I put an example here at this package because this is a complex pa package, a spatial package which contains lots of different dependencies. So as you can see, this package depends on this one, our methods. These are all the uh, packages that it needs. These are suggested packages. And then it also has, I don't know if it's big enough. It also has a lot of other requirements 
because it's a complicated special package, it has a lot of other requirements. And um, this can be a little bit more tricky to install because they're not just our packages. And so these are often the ones that create more problems. So how do you find the ball? How do you make sure that once you start making your R package, this is and you can easily reproduce all the environments that you need to build and run this project, make it reproducible, open, shareable, and safe and safe everywhere. So the suggestion that I got were um, mainly these ones. So the RM package is is not new. Like I think though, maybe it's not even that old. It's, it seems to be the emerging methods that allows you to manage. Um, packages and project dependencies in R. So what happens is that whenever you start a project or an R package and you're, you're satisfied with some uh, of your dependencies and you know install dependencies, you can run this RM snapshot. So this snapshot will sort of like create, it creates a lock, sort of like a lock file, which is a list of all the things that you need to be able to run this environment well. So it locks up, it creates a snapshot of your environment now. It is really useful because it allows you then, you can then share the log file with someone else and then someone else can just run it and have all that they need there. However, uh, it also produces sometimes more than you need. So you might, you might be really slow when you're trying to um, start up the RM. The suggestion that I got from a couple of people instead, uh, which were two of the speakers that I'm gonna mention soon is that they found really useful instead when you build all the dependencies for your project to start little and then grow from there. So for example, you start by looking at the package imports that you need. So for example, if I if I made my R package, I have all my all my library, all my R packages that I need to run my package. Well, this will be all the imports that, that I need. I need to have all these packages installed in an R session to be able to run my package. But then you can go and look for each one of these packages if there are some special dependencies for each package. The way in which we look for more special dependencies, there are some tools in, um, in the R ecosystem which are really useful. So one is this uh, SysRex uh, package. So this is an API to a database uh, so if you run sysrex commands and you provide the, um, the path to a description file of a package, it will tell you, it will run for you all the, um, all the commands to install all the system dependencies that you need. Another way is the R system requirements. So this is kind of similar. Is an R Studio independently maintained catalog of all the dependencies, which is used to power the R Studio package manager. So, if I show you, for example, what happens here in the R Studio package manager, uh, this is a package. Well, you can just put whatever package you need here. Say, for example, AA my package doesn't have me. Let's see if I put the SF package, which I had before. So the SF package, it tells you, you need to have all the system requirements to be able to successfully run your package. So this is definitely something that more an engine, more maybe engineering or people um, maybe in your yeah, engineering group might help with, but it's good to know because I found out that a lot of the engineers and developers in my team, they don't know anything about R. So a lot of the times we're coming back and forth with many different issues that I wasn't aware and they weren't aware. So the conference was really useful to really nail down all these different things, where to look for all, all, all these problems. So then next time maybe we don't have to waste so much time going back and forth. And um, the other, another interesting package is the make tools package. And this, when you run this make tools package system C steps for a package, it will give you the list of system dependencies that the package needs. So if you run it on all your imports and nothing comes out, you're safe, but otherwise you might need to install extra things. So this is um, these are awesome suggestions that I got from the two speakers. One was Peter Solimus, who gave a talk about data science serverless style with R and OpenFAS. 
And the other one was uh, Max Heldt, who was a speaker who gave us uh, a speech about this one, building data products strictly without magic. Unfortunately, they were overlapping with other, I could only see very part of it and I attended a question session because they were overlapping with the visual, visualization uh, session. If you're into these things, I also suggest to look at these other resources. One is a blog about the terminal system dependencies for our projects. The other one is um, a post made of user 2021, where um, they make a summary of all the talks about R in production. So it will list all the other sessions that I didn't really uh, attend. So this concludes my talk. I also put these slides there, but um, I'm not gonna really talk about it. it. It wasn't from the user conference, but this was a talk that my ex-colleague at Eliza gave uh, last year. Uh, he had to work on a project on making um, a machine learning model uh, in production for a company. And so this is sort of the infrastructure. He's an engineer, so this is the infrastructure that he found really useful. Uh, using the Plumber, Plumber R package, which generates API for R, and then packaging everything up with Docker. However, this could be a whole different talk. I just want to make sure that it's there. And this is the link to his slides, if anyone is interested in. Otherwise, um, this is almost concluding my talk. I put here a link to the art gallery slides. However, I'm pretty sure that it might take a little bit, oh, maybe not. It could take a bit to, lead, to load because they are all very heavy images. And uh, so I'm going to share the slides with you so that in, in your time, you'll, you'll be able to see all this beautiful artwork that, um, yeah, the people share the conference. I couldn't attend the, com the, this, the art gallery moment, but there was music in the background and artists were there. So it looked like a really, really special moment. This concludes my talk and I would like to thank definitely user organizers and speakers. It must have been really challenging to go through all of that online. Uh, definitely Mass Dynamics as well for letting me take part in the conference. Um, a lot of learning. I was really useful to look at Alison Hill uh, to learn how to make beautiful sliding using the Xaringham package. And I also, um, also thanks to Shazia because I checked um, Shazia's slides from the previous talk to check some tips to be able to, um, to, to see how I could build my slides in Xaringham slides. So this was my first talk in Xaringham. And um, it's definitely a learning cur curves, but it's definitely doable, especially yeah, looking at these slides from Alison, she goes through a lot of different things and really, really easy to understand um, slides. I also made a glossary at the end, all the packages that I mentioned with the links, and so that it might be easy just to go back and forth to different parts. Um, and I, yeah, I hope that you all had a great session. This is another artwork. If you have any question or you want to ask me about other things, feel free to contact me on Twitter. Um, and yeah, or even tonight, I'm happy to share my email later. Any, yeah, if you've got any question, I'm finished. That was fantastic, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, I think you've had a lot of people saying um, great presentation, so well done. Um, I think there is a question. Can you see that all right? Or would you like me to read that? Uh, yeah, stop sharing so I can read this. Yeah, read right. the questions. Uh, for the, the last one, yeah, for the package auto test, do you have to write the tests or just writing the example in each function is good? Um, yeah, so to the answer this first question, you need to have example functions. So, sorry. You need to have examples in your functions so that the auto test package will go and run those examples and it will try to mutate the input for all the parameters of your um, of your examples and try to see if it fails so it doesn't my understanding and again i haven't used it yet my understanding is that it doesn't run tests per se like it doesn't go into the test folder but it mutates inputs so that it tests the examples of your um of your package 
And the other part was, can it test the graphical output of functions like that? I am not sure. So if you have, the way that it works is yeah, going through examples. So if you, if you, if you can write examples with where the graphical output is in text, but I don't know that it can do directly from an image. Probably, I'm not sure about that. Um, okay, I think this was the question. Thank you all. Is that the question? I asked another question. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, what kind of data validation rules generally should be used while working with large database? Are there many rules of biological data other than missingness positivity? Okay. So in terms of the data validation rules, definitely that will depend on your data. So before um, you probably, you know, since you are the one using the data, it's good to know maybe, or if you're not the one who created the data, maybe you can talk to someone um, in your lab or someone you know that knows how the data should be. And so that you know that the input that you're using is correct. There isn't really as strict rules in what data be like. It depends really on the source of the data, the type. Um, I would imagine, for example, if you're looking at gene expression data, definitely everything should be positive. I mean, unless they're logged, but then you can check if they're not logged. So it just depends on the type of data and maybe just a little bit of knowledge about what everything is and how it should be would help you to make those rules. Yeah, I was thinking more in terms of like the usage of the validator package. Oh, okay. Um, so in, so how I can think of it is like, we would have generally three, four rules about a data or um, as many variables that we are working with. Uh, so even if we are having many rules, then we have to like, um, specify all the rules like that right and we will have a table with each row um corresponding to each rule uh, mm -hmm. so yeah i'm just thinking more in terms of uh, the usage of the validator function mm -hmm. that if there are some standard validation that should be done whenever we are working with data of course like it would depend on whichever data and the context that we are using yeah I'm not sure. I think I would say that there is the so the validation cookbook. I'm gonna share the slides in the chat anyway because um, they should be ready anyway. So the validation cookbook, which is what they what the author wrote. Uh, so yeah, these are the slides, but I'm gonna share that one. Data validation cookbook. It contains a lot of uh, these sort of rules. So maybe this one, it might be worth, for example, looking at um, all of this, the, the list of things that we got there. For example, they look at variable checks, um, uniqueness, multivariate checks, which is similar to what I was showing with the conditional island penguins. So I don't know that there are standard things, but yeah, I think I think there are already built-in things. For example, the is complete function already is a built-in of the validate package to check for completeness, so to look for NAs. So that's already like bringing all things. So you don't have to look for every column. Um, but yeah, apart from that, um, I would suggest, yeah, go through the book, check out all the functionalities or just the headlines. All right, thank you so much. Uh, packages for anomalies in high dimensional data. Oh yeah, there might be some neat applications for single cell. Yeah, definitely. I, I do think so, which is why I was pretty excited about the talk. I only see it half of it because I had to run away to a meeting, but I'm really glad that Sevandi accepted to talk next month. So yeah, I'm pretty, pretty excited. Um, so I have a not very uh, packet related question, but so okay. in terms of when you're working, like say you're producing a paper or you're working as a uh, project, how do you define or what's the workflow we should follow when you decide whether this code should belong to 
this R script, or how do you separate your R code into different parts for your analysis? So sorry, can you say it again? Is this related to the fusion package, the fusion package, or in general? No, I think it's just like to the broader audience that we have all the R experts yeah. here today. So what would be your guidance when you decide how to work with a large R project, and how do you divide it, your code into different scripts? Okay, different scripts. So not not related to yeah, probably a package itself. So I think like. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was doing my PhD, because of course, PhD is a long one. So you have lots of things going on. The general idea is that I try to keep a script separated by aim, by tasks. So say, for example, you have to do, it also changes a lot if you've got analysis scripts or you have to build a more software script. So you might think about that as well. So. Are you using the same, are you writing a file with a lot of functions and you're using them all over again? Then maybe you might want to think of bringing all these functions into a package so that you everything is in the package. You don't need to load the functions all the time. Everything is there. And then you do your analysis. So yeah, think a lot about the big chunks of what you have to do. Is this an analysis that it will just be a data analysis for our collaborators or for yourself? and it only requires to bring in other already existing functions, or is this an analysis that requires you to build your functions? And so maybe you can package them up to have them better stored. And um, I've, I've started using a lot more version control, but that's mainly for our packages, because I know that when you work with collaborators, you cannot push to GitHub uh, your script or data. So that's more private, even though you can have private repositories and version control and being able to just simply use GitHub for that, even in the private repositories, or just Git allows you to, of course, avoid duplications of a lot of scripts, um, copy and pasting and writing V1, V2 on, the, on all the different scripts. There's definitely a lot yeah, that we could talk about um, around that. Does this sort of answer your question or? Yeah. Thanks, Anna. I also see from the chat that Adele said she used a workflow R package. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I've used that as well. I did find it really good. Um, even though I haven't used it extensively, I thought from, my, from what I had to do, it was giving me a lot more than I needed. But it's also the case that I was working for myself. So no, I was just doing my PhD. So maybe if you have to work with someone else and maybe you need to, it's pretty good to share it. Um, actually, I'm, I'm lying. I'm a liar. <laughs> Last year, I, I used it extensively because I was helping my sister in Italy doing her master uh, re research, I mean, a part of her project. And so I did everything in Workflow out and it worked really well because it allowed me to share it easily with her by GitHub and then by the website so that she could just download the plots and do all the things. So yeah, that is definitely. Thank you, Emma and Adele for this idea. I'll look into it. Thank you, Adele. And there's a question from Shazia. Does the use this also help with project management? Don't actually show myself. It was so, kind of a response to Dida's question, but I'm not actually okay. sure. I think yeah, use correct. this more for yeah, maybe a project or package setup more than mm -hmm. management itself. Like it's really it's got like some you really useful um, for the documentations or like to set up the package really quickly, and a lot of other things. I'm I don't I mainly use it yeah for package setup or project setup rather than management. Yeah. Awesome. Don't think there are other questions. Well, if you've got any other question, yeah, feel free to um, send them on Twitter or anywhere else. And we're going to share the slides as well on, on Meetup. Cool. I don't know if there's anything that um, you wanted to say, Kathleen? Otherwise, I was just going to say, well done again. That was a great overview. And I look forward to having a, a good look through the slides again to look at all the cool packages you've shared with us and so much to, 
to think about. Um, anything, Shazia, to add? No, thanks everyone for sticking around yeah. and to Anna for a really excellent talk. And yeah, look out for the meetup, you know, the link on meetup or Twitter if you follow us, we'll, we'll put it up in several places so you can digest. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone for listening and for the questions. And um, awesome. well, have a good evening, everybody, and see you at the next meetup. See you, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Anna. Bye bye.